who is our uh, chief growth officer. And um, I think he's going to be joining soon. So why don't you go ahead, Salman, and introduce yourself and start with the training. Sure. Can I have sharing access, please? All right, sure, man. I do. Okay. Good evening and assalamu alaikum, everybody. My name is Salman Ahmed. I am a project manager at Your Portal, a Chicago based web design company. I've been working at RevStack for the better part of a year now. And prior to that, I had uh, close to three years of industry experience. And I hope to guide you thoroughly throughout this presentation about adaptability within the workplace. So let's dive in. First of all, our agenda revolves on two separate fronts. We shall firstly talk about adaptability in the workplace, working with cross-functional teams, uh, new managers, new employees, new team members, new co-workers, uh, how to adapt with them. And um, as I know, a lot of people in the RSA are new to working remotely. And how do you adapt to working remotely? Because it is a separate experience. It is a new experience. And how do you frame your mindset towards working more productively, more efficiently uh, while working from home. So first of all, let's understand the gist of adaptability. Let's try to realize uh, what adaptability truly is. Um, adaptability is adjusting to changes in your environment. Your environment can not only include your work environment, it includes your uh, household, your family, your friends, um, your hobbies, stuff. If, if the minutest of things changes in your environment, how do you react to that? That thoroughly depends on your mindset, on your character, and how you can uh, react to it by not letting your guard down. Now, um, as this presentation is about changes uh, that you may have to encounter while working in the workplace, let's dive into them. First of all, uh, a few things that you, you might encounter while uh, working are new ideas ideas that you might not have been used to uh, in your old job, um, ideas of your coworkers, your team members, people superior to you, people junior to you, you must have the ability to listen to them, to understand them and to acknowledge their expertise, their ideas and what they're saying. You need to listen to them, you need to have an open mind and you must uh, share your views just like they're sharing theirs. Then we have changes in responsibilities. Uh, now there might be more on your plate than there used to be, or there might be less on your plate uh, than there used to be as well. Um, an addition or a subtraction of responsibilities to the systems. Uh, it could change how you work. It could change uh, your efficiency. And I hope it is for the better, but you have to understand uh, why it is. And you have to understand the root cause of it. You have to understand how your business works and how uh, you're working in compliance with the issues and with the policies that um, surround the industry and that surround the business. Then we have shifting priorities. Uh, for example, you're working on a task and your boss comes up and tells you that this is an important. Uh, these two tasks are way more important than the thing you're working on. Now you have three incomplete tasks. Uh, uh, that might trigger your OCD a bit. That might uh, make you feel like you have stuff pending on your plate. But it's important to understand in the grand scheme of things uh, how you can prioritize them better. Uh, so shift your work priorities and be more uh, flexible. Try to understand how your work affects the entire business and how you should be prioritizing them. Then we have morphing strategies. Uh, Businesses usually have 20, 30, uh, 40 year plans. And I, I don't think any business could have predicted uh, the pandemic that we are currently engulfed in. That has obviously been a mental strain, a physical strain to us. And um, our business strategies have morphed around those. Now, now unexpected changes like um, a global pandemic or um, a virus that has engulfed our society right now, you have to adjust around them like we have done so successfully. Uh, you must improve your workload. You must uh, be more efficient 
in the way you are working. And you must try to understand that you are in between a pandemic. You are, uh, you, you might lose people, but uh, keeping that in mind, you need to uh, work more efficiently and understand yourself, your uh, habits and how you can uh, be more efficient in the way you work. Moreover, Salman, uh, go back to your, should... Salman, go back to your last slide, please. Yeah. So for everyone here, I think you, it's a great idea if you take a screenshot of this, because when you first get hired or anytime you're hired, you should be having these four conversations with your new employer. You know, what do they think about the best one? There's morphing strategies. Does that happen a lot in their business or is their strategy pretty fixed? And if you have these conversations at the beginning, you're going to know how to handle them as you encounter them based on what your employer is looking, you know, exactly for you to do. The other thing is going to set you off as being a pretty smart cookie because, <clears throat> you know, I'm guaranteeing that none of the people that they've hired prior to you uh, ever asked them these kind of questions. So just a thought for everybody. Uh, following up on what Jeff said, um, a question I usually ask uh, when an interviewer asks me if I have any questions is, can you please describe what a normal workday looks like? And that actually paints a picture in front of me of what they expect from me and what they expected from the last guy before me. Once I have that in mind, that really allows me to uh, work more fluidly and have a clear set of mind, I had a clear set of expectations of what I can get and what I can give in, in this job. Following on to the next slide, uh, you should be following new trends. Uh, I don't think any of us uh, in 2017 or in 2018 knew what Zoom was or what Microsoft Team was, uh, but now we can uh, work them with ease. So uh, let's not just uh, focus on video conferencing platforms. Maybe uh, GHL is new for you. Maybe Asana is new for you. Maybe Basecamp is new for you. Try to stay a step ahead. Try to learn as many new things as you can so that once your time comes, uh, you know how to work them. Um, and for new work processes, uh, each job has its own set of work processes. You can't really work the same way you used to work in your old job. Uh, take your time, spend a month, spend a month and a half. Try to understand the dynamic, the environment that you're working in. Try to understand how people work there and how things get done. Once you've settled down, uh, I believe you can be the most efficient worker that, that is possible. Now, that was the challenges, the issues that you might encounter when shifting jobs, when having a new workplace, but how do you adapt? First of all, be responsive. Be responsive to new information. Uh, new information that might not be what you expected. Uh, it might not be uh, what you were hoping for, but since it's been brought to light, you can ask as many questions as you like. It's always important to have clarity. It's always important to have a clear sense of mind. It's always important to do your research before you start embarking on that journey. Uh, once you have a clear set of mind, once you have a clear set of goals, uh, there's nothing that's stopping. Again, keep an open mind. Uh, when there's change, you have to be open to new experiences, to new new adventures to me, new people. So uh, one thing that I often, uh, my colleagues is that don't stay limited to your job description. It might be tons of other things. You might be forced to wear different hats. Um, having said that, um, it's always important to never shy away from a challenge. Um, always work with an open mind and uh, try to do take it on as a challenge and do it that might improve your skill set then personal development uh rsa i know has a new lms that is amazing it has tons of trainings go go for them uh, they're at uh, a touch's reach uh, go for it and try to work on yourself try to identify where you are at a disadvantage and try to uh, fix those disadvantages or if you try to uh, focus on your advantages Try to polish them more and try to make yourself unbeatable in that. Uh, for example, you could work on public speaking or your soft skills, or maybe you're not so good at writing emails or 
working on Google Suite or uh, Adobe or whatever. Uh, try working on, on your own personal growth, on your own personal development. And that obviously makes managers that it, it really shows that you're comfortable with change, with adapting into different environments. And uh, you, you can say yes to something different. Then you should understand the realms of control, uh, where your control starts and where it ends. It's important to establish boundaries and to know what you can control and what you can't control because it really reduces your mental strain. It really helps you know that uh, some things are beyond your control. And once you understand that, uh, you really don't worry about it anymore. And the things that you are that are in your control, you should try to influence them to the best of your abilities so that uh, always a good image is presented to your superiors. So have your experiences. Hang on a second. Talking about control, remember this is something that you may or may not be aware of, but a lot of the US based, especially, but pretty much all the rep stack clients have not necessarily worked with a virtual assistant or you know somebody in your particular role. And so in the beginning, they're gonna be very hesitant to um, give up that control until you prove yourself. So don't be surprised in the beginning if you feel a little bit chained down in your ability to make decisions, but as you continue to uh, prove your capabilities, they will release control to you. So just hang in there and, and remember, it takes a little bit of time to build trust. Thank you. Salman, back to absolutely, you. Absolutely. Then uh, always say yes to new experiences. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff. We have a lag. You're good. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so again, uh, you should have new new experiences. You should always uh, work with a diverse set of team. Don't stick to one team. Don't stick to your comfort zone. Try to work with new people, new di a diverse set of people and try to join a team or lead a team. This allows you to have an opportunity to work with a diverse group of people that have different mindsets, different experiences, different ways of working, different work, work ethic, and that really could help you grow as an individual. And if that doesn't help you grow as an individual, that might help you grow as a team member. It could also help your team members uh, learn more of you and you can learn of them. Then you should be able to show initiative. Raise your hand up to the craziest possible things. Uh, suggest uh, new work processes, things that can uh, help the business work more efficiently. And demonstrating initiative is always a good idea because it shows how proactive you are and how well uh, you can work in a leadership role. Then you should stay one step ahead. Uh, you should always read up on what's going on in your industry. Like, is it um, HVAC? Is it uh, web design? Whatever it is, you should be reading up on it. You should be ready for whatever the next big thing is. Should I move on, Jeff? No, so the other thing that I want everybody to be thinking about here um, is exactly what we're saying here. You know, jump into new experiences, show your initiative, um, stay one step ahead are all important things, but you have to do those proactively. And remember, um, I know Salman keeps using the word efficient, but there's a difference between efficient and effective. So you need to find out how your leader wants to work. Some people want great efficiency. That means they're doing several things in a, in a row. So the way I like to explain the story is I own a little business and I go in the morning and I efficiently pay all my bills. The problem is I ignored the fact that my business should have opened an hour and a half ago because I was just very efficient in paying my bills. So I lost all of the sales that could have happened in that hour and a half versus if I'm an effective leader, um, I'm paying bills for a couple hours in the morning then I'm going to open up my shop and you know, spend the day in my shop and tomorrow I'll come back and pay some more bills. That's a simple example of the difference between effectiveness and efficiency. 
And so you need to have that conversation again with, with your leader, which they want you to be. I always want my people that work for me to be effective. I'm less concerned about them being efficient because we're, we're a small company. You know, my company has about 26 people right now. And so we have to kind of do a little bit of everything to be successful. And you may be called upon that, that as well in the small businesses that you'll join. Back to you. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Sorry about that. No problem. Now, uh, we've talked about adapting to a different workplace. I know a lot of you are new here. I know a lot of you are new to working remotely. Uh, so I know working remotely has a lot of pros, it has a lot of cons, but let's uh, understand uh, how can we adapt to a completely different set of uh, environment. First of all, it's always important to have a dedicated workspace. When I joined RevStack, uh, I used to work from my bed. I just used to lay and sit on my bed and it really ruined my back uh, until my father told me off and God bless my father for telling me off. I started working on uh, my desk and my chair and it's done wonders for my back. Other than that, I feel that working on a dedicated workspace really puts you uh, in work mode. And once you're in work mode, you really know that you can't be distracted by other things. And uh, it's just as important as what you're working on. Other than that, when, when my family knows that I'm on my desk, I'm on my laptop, they choose not to distract me then. And that's what I mean by separating work from life. Uh, this is probably the most difficult hurdle, uh, but you have to sit them down. You have to have a conversation with them. You have to tell them that um, this is your career that, that they're talking about, and you need to uh, not be disturbed from these eight hours. Uh, you really can't go to the market. You really can't go out uh, just because you're working remotely. But... That does not mean that you shouldn't stop engaging with them. Uh, working remotely can be uh, a bit lonely uh, at times, but think about all the hours that you're saving from commute, from getting ready in the morning, and uh, you can actually use them to perhaps call that cousin of yours or talk to a family member that you've been putting off for too long. Uh, so it's always important to engage with your uh, community, with your friends, with your family. Uh, just so that you can uh, be more productive. Should I move on? So here's the thing that you need to consider, but I recommend if you're struggling, uh, kind of what Salman said, if he's sitting at his desk, everybody knows he's working. So when you start your work day, have a specific set of attire that you would wear to the business and dress in that. Maybe it's putting on your shoes instead of your sandals, whatever it might be for you. And then at the end of your work day, I mean, I do this every day. I change out of my work shirt into my off time shirt. But what it does for me is it's a distinct understanding that I have completed my work day. You know, and I know it's a silly little thing, but I do it every single day. I have a working shoes and working shirt when those are on i'm working when they come off i'm done for the day done for the week so just think about that and if you're struggling especially the biggest struggle that most of you are going to have is family members wanting to stick their head in and talk you know you're just here you're home so uh can we have a chat you know and someone's laughing because i'm sure this has happened to him many times they don't understand that that you're earning your living at home and just because you're sitting in that particular room or space doesn't mean you're just goofing off and that takes a lot now if you get lucky and you can have a door on your room that's best um i have a a couple so i've been coaching for several years i have a couple of students that have and I'm not sure what they look like in Pakistan, but in the United States, we have these orange cones that go up on the street to, you know, miss the pothole or 
So they're all safe, cones. So safety cones. Well, you can buy one that's about 10 inches tall in the United States. And so some of my students have purchased those. And when the cone's up, the family members know that they're not to be disturbed. When they take the cone down at the end of the day, like they stick it in the doorway, they take it down. Now they're available for family time and the rest of their lives. So figure out what works for you. That's just a silly example, but I actually has worked for several of my coaching students along the way. Back to you, Soma. That's awesome. It, I don't think it's silly. It's just a mental barrier that you have to get through. And whatever works for you, works for you. And uh, to finish off, I, I just feel that you guys should take the changes head on. Take every challenge, be it uh, working from home, working remotely, or uh, any team member that's not really uh, something, someone that you would like to work with. Just take it head on, take it as a challenge, and have a clear sight, have a clear goal, and have a clear light at the end of the tunnel. Once you have that light, just work towards that. And you will be completely removed of any barriers, of any boundaries, of any distractions if you just very focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you so much. All right, so Salman's done with his presentation, so I'm gonna take over at this point. And we're gonna jump into just a general question and answer period here for the next 30 minutes or so. So if you have a question, please do me a favor and type it up in the chat and we'll take the questions in the order. So it can be any kind of question about the United States, working with people in the United States, other countries, working from home. I've been working from home for, I think, about 12 years. Um, so I have a lot of experience doing that. I've been coaching for most of that 12 years as well. And one of the things I coach on is how to become more effective and, and efficient working remotely. So here's how this works. If nobody types up the question, then I start calling on people. So it usually works out better if you put the questions in. Otherwise, uh, I get to butcher your name to try to call you by your name. So, all right. So we've got ask about general health concerns when we're talking about working remotely, any tips? Um, you know, again, you need to set time aside. You need to discover, for example, in my world, this is how I work, I take about an hour and a half off in the, after I've worked about five hours of my shift and I do some uh, self-care, you know, whether that's exercise or meditation or other things. So I I don't just eat lunch very quickly and then get back to work. I've discovered over time that if I'm not taking care of myself, you know, I'm going to have problems. Now, some of you may not be able to do that, but talk to your clients about it. You'd be surprised if you present a good case um, that they wouldn't be receptive. But whatever you've done in your, here's the thing. It's time to put on your, pre-pandemic hat, okay? And what did you used to do? I don't care what you've done for the last 24 months or so. What did you used to do? Did you run? Did you walk? You know, uh, to Salman's point, did you spend an hour on the phone with a cousin or a relative or a friend every day? And that's not, that, that is a mental health tip, okay? What they're discovering is we're having more mental health issues than anything else because it can be really lonely. You know, one of the things, you know, this is a pretty big group. I think we're at about 150 uh, team members now here at RevStack or somewhere close to that. Find four or five people and set up a time on Monday mornings or Friday nights, you know, an hour before you start your shift or an hour after you stop your shift and get five or six people that you create a little um, group that likes to chat and get to know each other. No different than if I said to uh, each of you, hey, let's go out with my two friends here and have some coffee and just catch up and see what's going on. 
Uh, I personally have a couple of those small groups that I meet with about every two weeks. So, it, and, and none of them have anything to do with my recruiting business. None of them have anything to do with my, my duties here at RevStack either. So it, it, it's just the bringing those friends together in a remote situation if you're not comfortable going out to a co coffee shop. So can we cope with our mental health as we are just limited to our workspace at home? Um, you know, I think a big part of your mental health, this is just my opinion, but I think a big part of your mental health in your workspace is how your, whoever's living with you respects what you're doing in your time. Because if they're always coming into your room and pestering you, hey, can you come and do this? Can you come and do that? You know, and now you just add that stress that if you were in an actual workspace, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have mom sticking the head in the door. And, can you just come down and help me for 30 minutes, you know, move these boxes around or whatever that conversation looks like for you. But all of a sudden now you're like, but mom, I'm supposed to be on the phones making sales calls or whatever your responsibility is during that 30 minutes. I'll see you at the end of the day. But I also know, understand enough about Pakistani culture that your family is very important. So it's probably hard to say no. So you have to find that way. Again, get outside, breathe fresh air, exercise, find somebody to talk to, can, you know, pretty recurring or pretty refreshing. Uh, repetitively. Does working remotely make you unfriendly? All right, who put that up? I did. Okay, so why are you feeling unfriendly? Uh, well, you don't get to meet new people. Uh, you're just limited to the friends uh, that you, you know, work friends that you made uh, when you were working on site. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not meeting people, and that makes me feel that uh, you know maybe I'm just not gonna you know uh, I'm, I'm just gonna forget dealing with uh, you know a large uh, set of people. Well, that is a struggle here through COVID. There's there's no doubt about that. But that goes back to my recommendation. You know, I'm guessing you have two or three friends at this point that you talk to regularly. Is that a fair assumption? I got more than that, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be, you know, uh, I, I am a social person, but at the same time, I like, like working remotely. So right. I'm afraid so I'm here, not. Here's what my suggestion is. Pick two or three of those friends that you have that you really like and ask them, hey, let's on Friday at the end of the workday, morning, whatever time makes sense for you based on your schedule let's get together the three or the four of us but more importantly let's each bring a new friend into the mix right because it's no different than if i were going out to coffee and do you pronounce it hamza is that how you pronounce your name yeah so hamza you know i mean it'd be no different than me picking up the phone and saying hey let's have coffee and i'm going to bring my my good friend along because I really think you need to get to know him. He's a great person or whatever. So the biggest challenge I think is not letting the fact that you're stuck at home in the environment that you're in right now dictate how you live your life. Now I know it's a lot easier if you can just go to the party on a Friday night and hang out or Saturday night and hang out but you don't have that option. So think of ways to do that. Get three of your friends together, ask them to bring three friends along, set up a little once every other week or whatever meeting. And that's a way to get to know others. Plus the beauty of that is when we finally get past COVID and we're more out and about, um, you'll have some new people to talk to. Because I believe we're all going to have to reestablish our one-on-one -on -one human connection that has been lost through the lockdowns of folks. Does that help? Yeah, it makes sense. All right.
All right, lots of questions about making you unfriendly. Uh, Solomon, I guess, gave you an example of how you network while you're online. The other thing is, um, do you have an interest? Do you have a passion? Do you like to paint? Um, you know, do arts, crafts, make shoes, make purses. It doesn't really matter what it is, but you know, all of those hobbies pretty much now have online uh, groups and meetings, most of them at least once a month. Go out and join them, jump in, and don't limit yourself just to the groups that are in Pakistan. Remember, this is a global community today. So reach out, find a Facebook group, and start chatting in it that you have an interest in, and not necessarily work. And um, that's how you network. But you have to put it on, here's a, the key. You have to put it on your calendar and you have to do it consistently. And what I mean by that is, you know, every Friday I'm gonna spend an hour reaching out to my friends, reaching out to the special group or whatever, and trying to connect with people. And how many people here uh, by just a show of hands are in a Facebook group for some type of pleasure where you're watching the conversation, you're chatting, and hey, that's a perfect group because they've already raised their hand and said, hey, I like this sport or whatever the case may be, right? And so by default, all you have to do is jump into that group on that Friday afternoon and in that quick 30 to minutes an hour, just reach out to five or six people in the group and say, hey, I'd like to do what you like to do. This is not a sales call. I'm just trying to expand my network. Would you be interested in getting online for a Zoom call or a Teams call for you know just a quick 30 minutes sharing our experiences? And I, I know this works because this is how my wife, who's a glass artist, that's how she builds her network. She does something very similar to that. And it allows her to meet additional artists where if she just sat at home, she wouldn't do that. You can see every one of these here is kind of around the same. Okay, anxiety. Noor, tell me a little bit more. Um, okay, so um, I have really bad social anxiety and I get really nervous when I'm talking to new people. So um, it's really hard for me because um, I think the biggest challenge that I face um, in interacting with new people and in new environments is that I get really anxious while talking to people and uh, interacting with them. So, so do, you, um, do you get anxious while you're talking to them or do you get anxious before you talk to them? Just the idea and the thought of talking to other people is really um, stressful and um, makes me really anxious. Do you have a small group of friends? And I'm not talking about family now. Do you have a small group of friends or a pretty large group of friends? Um, I do have a large group of friends, but um, I have a very limited people who are really close to me. So like I know a lot of people, but um, the, my close friends are really just a very small circle. And that's normal, Nor. So that's, if you watch on TV, it look, they make it look like you should have 300 friends. But the reality is most of us have no more than five pretty close friends. How do I define a friend? You know, everybody can have a different definition, but here in Reno, Nevada, where I live, there's a, a street called Par Boulevard. And Par Boulevard is where the jail is at. And so I, my definition of a friend, or if I called you a friend, I would expect for you in the middle of the night to show up and bail me out of jail and take me home without a lecture. That's a friend. If you want to take me home and lecture me the whole way, well, you're an acquaintance, but you're not really a friend because, you know, if I'm in jail, I already have a whole bunch of stress I'm dealing with. I don't need to listen to you rant at me. And so 
I have about five people that fit into that category that I trust at that level, you know? And so for you, the biggest thing is just seriously pick a time every week and reach out to somebody in your network that you sort of know and just say hi. Nothing more. Hi, thinking about you today. And I bet you you're going to see the conversation start. Start them in chat again, Instagram, wherever, whatever you're using this right now. And then I think just the constantly doing a little bit of it, you're going to get past that anxiety. It's uh, something I teach for every every job out there is the equivalent of role playing, right? Let's practice this. So if you start practicing this with your closest friends and you say, who should I get to know? And they say, well, you should get to know Susie over here. She's an amazing whatever. And it's an interest you have. And even have that person introduce you and spend that 30 minute conversation with all three of you. You may connect to that person. You may find that you're not interested. But bottom line for everybody here on this call, you have to put in the effort if you want this to change, okay? So if you have fears, anxiety, you're lonely, all of those things, if you're not willing to take the effort, that is the reality. And get rid of this mindset, well, you know, I invited them and they never invite me. You know, everybody's different. And some people are naturally social, and they're going to always be the ones inviting you to let's hop on a call, let's go up for coffee, whatever that invitation is. You're going to have the shyer people that will love to go out to coffee with you, but they'll probably never raise their hand, and nor this may be describing you, and say, hey, do you want to go out with me? It's easy to say yes when your friend asks, but to do the outreach creates some anxiety. So, again, nothing wrong with that. but it's like most things in life, you have to work at it if you really want it. Because if, if you accept I'm going to be lonely and set at home, then that's what you're going to be. You're going to be lonely setting at home. And I don't think the majority of the people on this call want that. I mean, there's 38 of you here. I think most people have a certain type of uh, personal interaction that they're um, requiring. All right, I'm going to butcher your name here. Is it a deal? Yeah. So, uh, why uh, I posted this, you know, because uh, I've been working remotely around two, two plus years almost now. And uh, yes, in my normal working day, I do, you know, have to look after my kids and, uh, you know, at time, you know, look after my wife and some some things in different aspects, but not affecting my work generally. But at times it becomes really, you know, difficult that, you know, because my kids are, you know, still young, you know, they're little. So uh, uh, it becomes really hard to, uh, you know, because uh, I'm pretty close to them and, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the time even work, working, you know, I'm working, they don't touch my laptop, but uh, sometimes it becomes a little hard for me and how I can cope up with that, you know, to, uh, you know, stay with the uh, pattern that I have been working for the past two years and, but, you know, become more efficient, uh, uh, you know, not letting the feelings or uh, any kind of emotions uh, to be affected in my work generally? Well, um, your feelings and emotions are going to impact your work. So you can't do that. How, how um, flexible is your employer about the hours that you work? Uh, no, I just, no, right now I'm just new. I just uh, started, you know, in the trading into open site. And, uh, but in the past years, I've worked with the, uh, you know, multiple organizations and uh, they were, they were pretty re relaxed in a way that, yeah, right, fine, you, you, you have to look after the kids, fine. You get the task done, that's more important to us, you get the task done, that's pretty okay. Right. Okay, so how old are your children? Uh, one is two and the... Uh, L you broke up two and how old? Sorry? You said two years and how old you broke up? 
No, uh, my uh, the younger one is two years old, and uh, the eldest one is three years old. Right. And uh, the three-year-old's yeah. a perfect age, where you know, pick two times during your day that you're going to go spend thirty. Minutes, you're going to take a break from work, and you're going to go spend time with them. And you make a big deal about see the hands on the clock when the hands on the clock point like this. Daddy's going to be available, and we're going to do something fun for that 30 minutes. And then a few hours later, you're going to do something fun with them for another 30 minutes. So now they can watch the clock. You keep bringing it back to, but we can't do that until this. Dad's got to work. And, but make sure that whatever you're doing during the fun time with them is truly fun. Okay, it's not teaching them schoolwork or other things, but they know, and again, fun can be whatever you define it. It can be simply reading a book to them if that's what you define as fun. And for everyone here, you know, again, if, you're do, if you need to do something like this or want to do something like this, just work with your employer. I mean, so many employers, so many clients, they're task driven. So if you get your task done, most of them aren't going to say anything if you take a couple of extra breaks during the day and spend it with your family. It can be the same thing, uh, a deal. I do something very similar with my wife. I, I don't have any young children in my house anymore, but we have a time every day where I stop working. I go sit out at the dining room table and we chat for 15 or 20 minutes because otherwise her complaint is I never leave my room. I never stop working, you know? And so I hear that all the time and I'm like, whoa, stop the conversation here. Yesterday I sat at the table for 20 minutes. We talked about whatever you wanted to talk about. And it's only 20 minutes, but remember it's 20 or 30 minutes of focused time. Most of you spend time with your children and your spouse, but it's not focused time. You're taking care of the kids, you're running around, the meal's being cooked, so you're trying to talk to them while they're cooking, you know, whatever's going on. That isn't real 20 or 30 minutes of quality time. That's kind of squeezing them or you into their life around all of the other busyness that they have going on. So um, the key here, I think, is you got to decide you want it, and then you got to figure out what works for you. But again, even if you had, you know, at, at 10 o'clock, dad's going to come out for the next 30 minutes, we're going to watch this cartoon together, or we're going to read this book together. And we do that every day. And we do it at that's, the exact same time. That's the strategy that you mentioned about the time where we loved it. We'll, uh, you know, uh, try that definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, because again, at that age, two and three years old, you know, they don't really understand the clock probably very well at this point, but they can read, you know, whether you have an old analog clock with hands on it or a digital clock. Yeah. yeah. Digital clock says 10 in this box, dad's coming out. Be ready, have your toy ready, you know. And so now they're planning on that time. It's, it's like vacation. Is When you take a time off, take a holiday, let's say you go someplace for a week, and if you're married, where is the majority of the joy felt? Is it in actually going on the holiday? Or is it in the planning of the holiday? Thank well, you for a second. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Nice. Thank it's you. In, Thank it's you. in the planning. For most people, it's like, oh, we checked out the airlines and flights, and then we looked for these hotels, and then we found the rental car and then we found this special resort and down the streets the water park and you know this goes on for five or six months before you actually take the seven day period of time off and there's all kinds of joy emanating out of that process that most people don't take into account so that's kind of what i'm saying with your children is if you can get them trained dad comes out 10 o'clock have your toy ready know exactly what you want to do with dad today and, and then you honor whatever they want to do for that 30 minutes. I think give that a test drive and then, you know, do me a favor and uh, Jeff at RepStack.co, send me an email in the 30 days from now and tell me if it's working for you. 
How's that sound? Sounds cool. Sounds cool. Definitely. I would uh, try this and uh, definitely send you an email on that. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. that. Despite having different channels for communications, there's barrier, barriers to communication still remain. All right, I'm not gonna even try to say your name. Is it probably Sarah, Sarah? Yeah, it's Sarah. Sarah, okay. So yeah. what, are, what, what are the barriers that you're finding? Um, because previously I was working from the office uh, in my previous job. So I just felt that, you know, uh, the, the effectiveness of in-person uh, meetings with the clients worked much better, was much, a lot higher than, you know, communicating with international clients, uh, you know, when you're communicating through Skype or through, you know, uh, these online platforms. Uh, so I just feel that, you know, in-person, while you, you're having communication in-person, uh, that has the least amount of communication barrier while you know i just feel that you know i'm not able to communicate uh, my ideas better to a person you know whom i'm communicating online uh, so yeah so first is remember what you just stated there is an opinion it's not a fact so what i want you to do is i want you to go out and do some research on the research that's been done about remote meetings versus in-person meetings and I think you'll find that communication is actually better when handled correctly. But that means, you know, in a quiet space, uninterrupted, just there's a whole list of things that I could go through. But the other thing is if you're going to work in this remote type setting, I would be reading like crazy how to be successful in a remote workspace, how to communicate better as a remote worker. There's all kinds of articles and books and videos out there. And you have to study and become an expert at the new way that you're doing your business versus the old way that you did it in the past. Unless, you know, you're deciding that, you know, this is a, a short-term gig for me and I can't wait until I go back to my four walls and my desk and hang out with my friends. So there's all kinds of things. So in my business, like I said, there's about 26 of us. Two mornings a week, we have what we call water cooler moments. So everybody that's worked inside of a building, there's probably been some kind of little kitchen area and there's a water cooler or a coffee pot or whatever. And so as you're filling up your glass of water or coffee, somebody walks in, you chat with them, get, you know, how was your weekend? all of that kind of conversation. We actively do that in a virtual environment. So we actually they set time aside at the beginning of our meetings to do that so that we're engaging at a more personal level than just, you know, here's the business we're talking about. We don't talk about anything else. The more you get to know those people, the better you'll feel about your ability to communicate with them as well. Sure, I'll do my research on that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's nothing. Same email. If you don't find anything, let me know and I'll go find it and get it to you. Because I know there's got to be writing on, again, that, what you're really asking is what are the best ways to communicate on these channels to feel more engaged, more informed, you know, yeah. variations of that. And there's people way smarter than me that have written about it is part of my uh, part of my opinion. All right. How do you cope with working during the night? Well, about you know twenty percent or more of the entire world's workforce work at night, and you have to find what works for you. I have people that are in the Philippines, Pakistan, and India that work you know, on my team. So they, they face the same challenges. So one of the things that I've given my team members permission to do is if they're just you know, wiped out, tired, go take a little nap. You know, if that means two hours in the middle of your shift, 
Just tell me what you're up to and then go do it and then add that time on to your day. I have others, and this is a negotiation that you have to have with your, with your client. I have others on my team that work four hours in the night and then they work a split shift where they work four hours during the day. So, you know, work on that. Find out what time your employer really needs you to be available, okay? I know we talk about, we work working what, eight to five Eastern time, is that what you guys are working, most of you? Or that's what you've been talked about? Yeah, it's like uh, six to uh, three. Okay, perfect. And that's great guide, guidance, guidance. But again, like in my world, um, every one of my team members has to be available from 10 to 2 central time. And then they can choose to work before that, which means that they're not working so late into the night. They're getting done at about 2 and 2.30 p.m. versus 5 or 5.30 local time. So have that conversation. You know, I understand you have an agreement and you have a contract with each of these clients, but you'd be surprised at how many, if you're really doing your job and you're taking the load off, they understand and they're going to work for, work with you to be successful. Uh, but if you don't communicate with them your challenges around working nights, you're going to be a struggle. I have one young lady that, you know, she works um four nine hour days and a four hour day so every friday night um prior to the weekend she gets a little bit of extra sleep so that she can spend time with her family so she's not quite as tired during the day these are all just ideas um but you know take these ideas and see how you can make it work for for you Thank you. All right. Amna, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, it is. Can you turn your camera on? It's so much better if I can see your face. Sure. It was just having some problems with my camera. It was coming on and off, so I thought I should just turn it off. Okay, that's fine. So, if I may ask, who's the family member that's causing the problem? Um, actually, I have a very supportive uh, husband, but uh, my um, mother-in-law and like, you know, my in-laws are not that uh, aware that I have to be at my workstation with my workers. And so I think it makes uh, it a little bit difficult because they think that this is uh, not serious or anything. So um, otherwise, uh, from my husband, it's no problem. But it's just a little bit of that problem. So number one, you, need, you and your husband need to sit down and talk to his parents. Mm -hmm. And make, the, I mean, make this a special moment. You all get around the table. You all need it in the living room, wherever you need and have this conversation where he, they can hear his support of what you're doing in a moment in time, not just a, you know, we're chatting along the way. It's, hey, mom and dad, I really need your support here. And then again, I'm not as familiar with your culture, but um, can you negotiate, for example, that you're not responsible for helping to prepare one of the meals? You'll take a different meal every day so you can sleep through a meal and you know i think it's an ongoing i don't care what your culture is i think that your in-laws want to see you be successful you know they just may not understand what you're trying to accomplish because their generation didn't have this opportunity to have the ability to work yes. from home work at night so they don't get it at all so yes. Something you may not be aware of most of you is for a person to truly hear your message, you have to tell it to them seven times. 
Okay. All right. So think about how have you sat down at the table with your spouse and his parents seven times and said had the same conversation. And no, guess, it's not been it's not been seven times, but I think I will make sure. Yeah, that, sometimes. Sometimes it does. You know. Sometimes it takes 17 times and it's uh and you don't even reach any results even after that. Well, yeah, and then you know, there's a point in um your life where you're gonna have to decide what pressure you're not yeah. going to continue to take. And yeah. I hate to say this, but you may not be able to work, you know, because that's not important to them. And you have to, I'm assuming you want to get along with it. You don't have, yeah. to, you know, that makes life better. So, yeah, no, I've been working from home for over four years now, but uh, yeah. So this, just, is still, this is still a problem four years later. Yeah, um, actually, uh, it was not a problem before. Um, they just came to live with me a little while ago. So <laughs> it wasn't a problem before, but right now it's a bit of a problem that I think it's taking a toll on my mental health as well. Yeah, so, you know, I talked about the little street count, right? Some kind of yeah. symbol on your desk that says, I can't talk right now, I'm on the <laughs> phone, I'm working, you know. Yeah. Find some visuals that might help them out as well. Okay. Because I think they want to be supportive of, of you. Yeah, they're, they're not to... they're not bad people. <laughs> no, but they're I, not I, bad they, people. They're just of a generation that doesn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're sitting there today scratching their head. How did she just talk to somebody from Pakistan to this guy in Reno, Nevada? <laughs> How the heck did that work out? You know, is it a, a yeah. string, you know, with two cans on the end? And I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but I'm not because like my parents are older. They don't get me working, you know, the way I do remotely. They're like, how'd you talk to that person today on Zoom? What's that all about? You know, and, and then they have to explain Zoom. And yes, I've explained Zoom probably way more than 17 times, but I have to <laughs> re-explain it. And then I talk about, you know, this is what I did or what I did do. So. I, I wouldn't quit. I wouldn't give up. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. And but I think it's important that instead of you having the conversation alone, your husband needs to be there to show his support. Yeah. And they are his parents, so they'll either pay more attention to him or they'll ignore him. But you've made the effort, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that that would be my my suggestion. I hope it works. If it doesn't, be on another one of these calls and we'll come up with another. <laughs> okay, thank that. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, so I think we're coming up on the hour here. Um, thanks for everybody's questions. I hope this um, was helpful. I noticed that there are you know, a lot of questions here about you know, the work environment and things like that. And I think that's important. And, and I know I'm on the leadership team here at RepStack and we're constantly talking about those issues. So, um, you know, we're trying to find better ways to, to handle it. But unfortunately, the reality is if you wanna work with a US-based company, um, it's probably gonna be in the, at least the late evening, early night, or you know through the entire night and then you just have to you know find the way to be successful at that and again it's just the same advice i gave earlier you know read a hundred different art and i'm serious a hundred not two or three a hundred different articles about how to cope with working remotely and night shift there's at least that many blog posts out there something is going to trigger in your head, hey, that's what's going to work for me, whatever that is. And once you figure that out, that is how you'll be successful. Now, I know that, and I've worked off and on nights through my whole career, so I know the struggles, but I also know that um, 
the rewards that I got for that choice I made were well outweighed some of the difficulties I had around being tired and and figuring out how to live a family life when you, you want to sleep and they all want to play. You know. So thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks Salman for your presentation. I thought it was great. And if you have any additional questions, as always, reach thanks, out. Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff Fisher and Salman Ahmed for this very informative, wonderful session. Um, Thank you so much. Um, it was a very informative session and we my, we learned a lot. Uh, thank you for your time. My pleasure. That's why I love doing this once a month. So good luck with your clients. If you have issues, reach out to your, you know, your manager, tell them what your issues are. If you get a client and they'll help you be successful. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.